What's going to happen to them next? Well, they're going to go through the Golgi apparatus. So, the Golgi apparatus, um, as we mentioned, has cis-Golgi network, cis-medial trans, and TGN. And proteins go through this, and the process by which proteins go through the Golgi is so controversial right now that I'm not really going to speak about it. If you're interested, there's some information in the textbook. You can come up afterwards. But there, there's really a lot of debate as to how proteins go from the cis network to the trans network. So I'm just not going to speak about that subject because it's going to go eventually figure it out. So when proteins arrive in the cis network, they make their way to the cis this. They make their way to the cis Golgi, and in the cis Golgi, there are other monosidases. Eventually, I'm simplifying a bit, but eventually they trim the mannoses from man 8 down to man 3. Man didn't trim very well there. Man, man 3. So there's going to only be 3 mannoses left. Then the protein will make its way into the medial Golgi. And in the medial Golgi, it will be acted on by another by an enzyme that's a glycosyl transferase, and it transfers N acetylglucosamine to this chain. And actually, it will eventually trans, uh, put three of them normally on this chain. This enzyme is a membrane protein that uses UDP and acetylglucosamine as a substrate. So it glycosylates this protein. Then the protein with its oligosaccharide side chain would make it here. Of course, if it doesn't have an N-linked sugar, it's not going to get processed by these enzymes. It would just move from cis to trans. It gets to the trans Golgi network. And here there are two other enzymes. I covered up one of them. Galactosyl transferase and sial transferase. And what they do is they also use nucleotide sugars to put galactose and sialic acid on the ends of these chains. So proteins that have this terminal glycosylation will have uh, N-acetylglucosamine, galactose, and sialic acid. And there can be some other modifications that I'm sort of not going to talk about. This isn't the only thing that and then this whole protein complex gets to the trans Golgi network. In the trans Golgi network, there are other changes that can occur. There's another enzyme called furin. And certain proteins, for example, this is meant to represent uh, proteins such as the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor is made up of, is a dimer. But it really has four so it's not just, but it's not just two subunits in the active form, it's actually four. But they're made as precursors. So there's two made initially, and then this enzyme furin cleaving at the basic sites in a particular place in the enzyme is able to cleave it into four subunits, which remain together, and now the insulin receptor is active and can bind to insulin. Same thing happens with the HIV like a protein, the one that's important for the virus, for the HIV virus. It's the envelope protein of the virus, which is a transmembrane protein. It's synthesized in the endoplasmic particulum, transported through the Golgi. It has sugars, they're modified. When it gets to the trans-Golgi network, it's inactive. And it's converted to the GP120-40 complex, which is active, by purin when it gets to the trans and then it's transported out to the plasma membrane and the virus particles in the form. So these are, this is an important modification that occurs actually in the trans network. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, what was the, the, uh, the enzyme that acts, that acts on the uh, protein in the mid? Okay, all of these are called glycosyl transferases. So this one is called N-acetylglucosamine transferase because that's the sugar that it puts on. So that's the name, the way you do the name. The name is just the sugar 
transfer it. Any other questions? All right, so let's talk about what happens at the trans Golgi network. At the trans Golgi network, we said already there are three phases. You can go to endosomes and lysosomes. You can go to via the constitutive pathway off of the plasma membrane. And you can go via the regulated pathway out to secretory granules. I'm going to start with the constitutive, I'm sorry, with the endosome lysosome pathway. Let's see if I have it. Okay, I'll go over here. I'll just take this one. So there is endosome and lysosomal, lysosomal hydrolases have to make their way to the lysosome specifically. Those are the hydrolases that chew things up. And you're going to need them in order to turn proteins over, membrane proteins in particular. You're going to need those enzymes, and there's a lot of, um, there are, when you're missing those enzymes, that causes a lot of problems. Dr. Ren will mention that later on. So those enzymes have to get into the lumen of the lysosome. And the way this works is the lysosomal enzymes are recognized in the cis-Golgi. Oh, I have one in the cis-Golgi. There you go. They're recognized in the cis-Golgi over here as being special proteins. There's a special enzyme called the mannose-6-phosphate phosphotransferase. And it transfers eventually a phosphate residue to mannose residues on the oligosaccharide side chain. And this happens before trimming. So these side chains have man 8 structures. And once they get phosphorylated, they're not acted on by any other enzyme. So this modification, the mannose 6-phosphate, remains with the protein as it's transported through the Golgi to the trans -Golgi. When it gets to the trans-Golgi network, there's a receptor in the membrane of the trans-Golgi network. That's called the mannose 6-phosphate receptor. The mannose 6-phosphate receptor will bind to the phosphorylated lysosomal enzymes. And using a similar mechanism to what we talked about before for other proteins, there's an RGTP protein. It recruits clathrin coat, and there are other proteins involved in this that I'm not going to talk about in detail, that recognize a specific code, a dilucine as it's called, a dilucine motif in the cytoplasmic tail of this protein, cluster this along with its cargo in a clathrin coated coat, which pinches off and forms a clathrin coated vesicle. We saw those vesicles when we looked in the EM. In the cell structure lab, the vesicles near the Golgi apparatus are formed this way. They carry the mannose 6-phosphate receptor, the mannose 6-phosphate. This whole complex gets to the endosome, where this dissociates. The mannose receptor dissociates from the isosomal hydrolase because this is low pH. And then the hydrolase goes to the lysosome, and the receptor can recycle back to the Golgi apparatus. I'm not going to go through the mechanism of that. All right, so that's how proteins that need to be in the lysosome get there. So that's a signal-mediated process. This process of getting into storage granules, which only occurs in certain cells, like insulin-secreting cells in, the, in your pancreas, this process is also regulated. Proteins that need to get in here can get in here, and the ones that are not supposed to be here are excluded. Only it's a little bit more complicated. This is meant to represent pro-insulin. That's one of the enzymes, that's one of the proteins that needs to get into secretory granules and pancreatic beta cells, for example, where it's made. Pro-insulin tends to aggregate at low pH, and it turns out that the pH of the trans Golgi network is about pH 6. And that means this begins to aggregate at that point. Other proteins aggregate with it, including, as my lab has shown, some membrane proteins. Those membrane proteins and soluble proteins pinch off into something called an immature secretory granule. 
the immature secretory granule continue, the pH of the in, immature secretory granule continues to fall. The pH will fall below six. Oh, here it is. I read it already. The pH will fall below six. That means there will be even more condensation of hormones like proinsulin. And then something else happens as well, at least in the hormone case of this particular hormone and other hormones that are converted from precursors into peptides. And that is there's the activation of enzymes that are packaged along with the proinsulin in this pathway. And those are called prohormone convertases. And what they do in this case is they cleave insulin at two dibasic sites. I'm not as good as the enzyme at cleaving it, apparently. And this makes insulin and the C peptide. You may have heard of the C peptide before. It's often used to measure how much insulin you're producing because. If you're giving people artificial insulin, you can't measure insulin in them. You have to measure, you can't measure how much they're producing. You have to use another, you use the C peptide instead. So you're going to be doing a lot of clinical, a clinical detection of the C peptide. Once this is separated, insulin tends to aggregate very well. And this aggregated mass of hormones and membrane proteins then matures into what's called a mature secretory granule. And this will undergo exocytosis. We'll see how that works. Processing of prohormones is not limited to insulin. ACTH, which you need to produce, is, I didn't put a tape on it, but it's also produced by the same mechanisms in pituitary cells. So this is a common mechanism that's used in, in hormone processing. All right, so this is a regulated pathway. Now, as the immature granule matures, as you can see the way I've drawn it here, there actually is too much membrane. Because as this condenses, you don't need so much membrane. So a lot of it is removed by clastin-coated vesicles that, that arise from this domain, and they take proteins back to the uh, Golgi that aren't supposed to get into the mature secretory granules. And, and so you have, again, a kind of recycling system here working in this case, too. And finally, the rest of the components get into the constitutive pathway where they're taken out from the plasma membrane. It seems like a simple story. Whatever isn't taken in one direction and another is taken out the constitutive pathway. That's partially true. But as we'll see, there's actually a, a wrinkle in that because some proteins have to go to different domains in the plasma membrane. So it turns out that there's some signal-mediated processes here, too. And I'm going to go to the slides to talk about those in more detail. Okay, everybody <coughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it aggregates in the lumen of the trans network together with the prohormones. Yeah.